This is episode 307 of JumbleThink. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to JumbleThink, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning their dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's show is Captain David Marquet. More about Captain Marquet in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, you've never subscribed to JumbleThink, head on over to your favorite place to listen to podcasts, search for JumbleThink, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to jumblethink.com, you can find links to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and more. Now let's jump into today's show. Hey there, welcome to JumbleThink. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host, and we have a great conversation lined up for you in a moment. Before we dive into that, we want to thank our friends over at Floxy. Floxy can help you with professional design, video editing, writing, web development, and more for your next project. They're doing really cool stuff, and whether you are a small business owner, an entrepreneur, even an agency owner, they can help you. Best of all, they're going to help you by giving 10% off your first month. All you have to do is head on over to Floxy, F-L-O-C-K-S-Y dot com slash JumbleThink to learn more about them. Now, today on the show, I am super excited about this conversation. It is with Captain David Marquet. He was a top graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, commanded a nuclear-powered fast attack submarine, the USS Santa Fe, from 1999 to 2001. Since retiring from the Navy, he has worked with businesses globally as a leadership consultant. He gives presentations around the world about his acclaimed first book, Turn the Ship Around, a true story of turning followers into leaders. He recently launched or released a new book called Leadership as a Language, The Hidden Power of What You Say and What You Don't. I am really enjoying this book. I'm still working my way through it, but I I love the stories and then how he actually applies that to leadership. So we're going to talk about his time working for the Navy. We're going to talk about this book and how you can become a better leader well, why don't we just jump into this conversation with Captain David Marquet. Our guest today is Captain David Marquet. I'm super excited about this conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Michael, for having me on your show. Now, we're going to talk a lot about your book, especially in the second segment, Leadership is Language, The Hidden Power of What You Say and What You Don't. Super cool book. I'm devouring it right now. It's, it's my book that I'm working on this week and I love in every moment of it. You were a commander of the USS Santa Fe from 1999 to 2001. It's a fast attack nuclear power submarine. Uh, you know, a lot of your story comes from the leadership you learned on that ship and how that changed or began to spark the change of how you viewed leadership. I've got to ask, though, to start it off, what in the world is a fast attack nuclear powered submarine? We've heard no nuclear powered <laughs> submarines and stuff, but what, what is the role of that ship? Well, so in the Air Force, you have bombers and fighters. Yeah. So you have the same kind of thing in the Navy. Uh, we, we have different names, of course, better names. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the bombers are the ballistic missile submarines. They have the big Trident missiles that can go thousands of miles and have nuclear warheads. And then we have the fighters. And that's what a fast attack uh, submarine is. And we go and we hunt. We hunt the other guys ship submarines and we do other things like deliver seal teams on their missions so we're sort of the 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 the, the pilots would laugh at this but we're sort of the sexy arm of the undersea force <laughs> that's cool <laughs> i mean it, it, so many movies made about the world of military submarine actions yep. and what that looks like you know if you're an aircraft carrier uh commander that's got to be a completely different space because there's space to walk away <laughs> cool down and process and 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 you guys are in close quarters probably not seeing the light of day sometimes for weeks uh, yeah. or days uh, tell us a little bit about that environment and what it's like to work and lead a team of people underwater for so long it's it's an intimate experience. We actually share beds. 
<laughs> Not at the same time. Everyone <laughs> calm down. But uh, a, a bonk is about calculated it one day. It's basically two million dollars worth of real estate if you just add up like the value <laughs> and the cost and the amount of habitable space. And so the government's very stingy with bunks. And so we have 117 bunks, but 135 to maybe even as high as 150 people going to see. So we share, we're sharing. So one person's on watch and then the other person's sleeping. They get up and they go and watch and the person jumps in the bunk. But it's, sometimes the time is so short, the bunk is still warm from their body heat, the previous <laughs> person. So it's, it's a truly intimate experience. It's a close coupled system. You say one thing to one person very quickly propagates throughout the whole ship. And you can use that to your advantage. Wow. Wow. And it, what you are working on is so critical to the mission. There's little space for error because the decisions you make rapidly can escalate. And, and I know that's part of the, the the shift that you had to make on this submarine to help bring a better environment. Tell us a little bit about your fuller picture of your military experience, the things you worked on, uh, and uh, the broader picture of what you did. So I came up through the ranks. I was I was a really good leader. I was a really good industrial age and industrial model leader. I was really good at telling people what to do, getting them to do it. I used the word I inspired or motivated my team, but the true word was coerced. I used <laughs> you know dint of rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, influence, rank, whatever, to get other people to do what I wanted them to do. Wow. And the, 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 the bias was always towards avoiding errors. Mm. Don't screw up. Don't make a mistake. Don't melt down the reactor. Don't shoot the wrong people. And those things are important. But, but the problem is in your brain, if you're driving into work and you're like, oh, don't, don't be less screwed up today than I was yesterday. <laughs> it's not an inspirational way to be. No. So, so we have to flip all that. So we say, okay, here we're here to achieve excellence. Now, in in achieving excellence, we're going to reduce the number of errors that we make. But our mindsets are on achieving it. It's just like the superhero movies. Yeah, they're there to achieve greatness. They're all flawed. We know that. That's what makes it so fun. Yeah. Uh, so if they, so it's not about oh, how fun would a movie be if all we did was watch a bunch of characters all day long? And say, well, I'm not going to make a mistake. Like that's not fun. It's not fun <laughs> in movies. It's not fun in life. Yeah. So the whole thing is that you got to flip it. And the second thing is, I it was about telling people what to do. When I made a bad order, so it came, it came to light. My whole leadership philosophy was flawed when I gave a bad order and the officer repeated it. Yeah. Now in the past, I'd always like, okay, well, I just got to give better orders. That's the key. And this time my brain went to a different place. It said, you know what? Actually, what I need is a team that never needs me to tell them what to do. <laughs> and so it took me down a totally different path. Yeah. So the problem wasn't me giving bad orders. The problem was me giving orders. Yeah. And so I, I became what I call a knowing, don't know, but don't tell. Mm. we normally think, oh, I know the answer. I got to tell the team because that's going to create production. That's going to make everyone happy. Now, I don't know the answer, so I'm not going to tell. But you can – here's a here new newsflash, ladies and gentlemen. You can know the answer and not blurt it out. I have <laughs> problems can, with that. I, yeah, I, I know. I, know. We all I always want to be the guy that knows, you know? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we, 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 A, derive psychological satisfaction from that and – we get rewarded for it, yeah. but here's the deal: you're not building a leadership team. So I, so the, I'd be on the submarine and I'd walk into the control room and we'd be driving east. And in my head, I say, "Well, we really need to be driving west to achieve <laughs> this mission. Why are we driving east?" And I would so want to say, "Turn around, go west." <laughs> but instead, I say, "Hey, what are we trying to achieve here today? And what's our mission? And oh, well, we're supposed to protect the aircraft carrier, or no, it changed. Now we're supposed to do." We're supposed to uh, collect intelligence off of a cell phone tower or something. All right. Well, how are we going to do that? Anyway, that's kind of a gross example. But so I so want to just tell them. Uh, <laughs> but I would say, OK, I'll, I'll be back in five minutes. Let me know. You guys <laughs> It is so hard. Uh, I, 
you know, before we get too much further into the, the topic of your book, I, I want to hear a little bit of the story of your pivot, because I have so many friends who have worked in the military and military is kind of one of those interesting careers where it does have to an extent a time limit. And a lot of people move on and they have a second act where a lot of career people might go into a specific industry and just stay there for 40, 50 years. You get to reinvent what you're doing and you're making that pivot into this message of leadership and consulting around leadership. How did you end up on that? As you retire out of the military, you decide, hey, I I still have a lot of good years to contribute to society. How would (laughs) you land on this? Total forethought and good planning. No, it was all accident and panic. <laughs> okay. So, so I get out of the military. So, so here's what happens. I had this amazing experience on the submarine where we turned the ship around. We went from worst to first. But I treated them like leaders, and I, and I activated the thinking. And we did it in a whole bunch of ways. We changed the words that we used. But fundamentally, it was activating the thinking. We went from one thinker and 135 doers to 135 active thinking, passionate people. 10 years later, I'm getting out of the military. By now, 10 of the officers who were on that ship have been selected to be submarine commanders. Wow. How cool is that? Yeah. It's amazing. And so I retire and I kind of start doing this. I form a company, start doing some consulting. It's It was mind-numbingly dissatisfying work. Mm. You know, I'd be sitting on these conference calls with 30 people attempting to design something that was going to be built in 30 years. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what am I doing? Oh, but look, I was making, I was building the government X number of dollars per hour. How exciting. But it was, and my wife's like, well, you should write a book. And I'm, I was like, no, I'm an engineer. Why are you crazy? <laughs> and she said, well, this is a cool story. It's not the story of turning the ship around. That's just a hook. Yeah. It's the story of the, the, what happened when you left? What do we normally want? Oh, I leave. I want it to go down. Yeah. I actually want, because then look how great I was. And I think the best thing an organization could do is say, you know what, for everyone in a leadership position, we're going to evaluate you a year after you leave. You were, you, you were the, I don't care. You were the manager of a McDonald's store where you were the factory manager for a whole oil refinery. A year after you leave, I'm going to evaluate you on how your team performs without you. Wow. That is a measure of leadership. Everything up to that point is achievement. Yeah. So, so we we achieved a lot, but we also had this leadership thing going on, and that to me was really really interesting. There's too many leadership books about the achievement part of this, and so I listen to my wife and I started always a good a place to start. It's all, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> always do that. So I, um, and it was very hard, but as an engineer, I started, I said, well, what is the story? I just started with, we'll write a story. What's a story? Mm. Well, I don't know. So I started reading Aesop's fables. Yeah. And Grimm's very, I like, I just, and I said, okay, let's deconstruct this. What is it? What are the components of this thing? And I, and I read, um, uh, hero's journey and I, I deconstruct this might be interesting so i let me tell you here's a story an orphan has a secret power which only he knows and then discovers it and it turns out there's a group of people that share that secret power and he holds the thing in his hand to wield the secret power and they use it to fight the force of evil yeah now if i said what story am i telling Half the people are going to say, oh, well, that's obviously you're talking about Star Wars. The other people, half the people are going to say, oh, no, that's obviously Harry Potter. Yeah, it's exactly the same story, people. Yeah, it's all, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell and uh, the hero's journey just so tells that so well about like like there's a common thread of a story, a cycle. It's a circle of the hero's journey. So how did that become? Your story, how did you apply that to what you were writing about your journey? It was it was uncomfortable because I played the hero in my story mm. and I didn't feel like the hero. But I realized. So, for example, I carried a flashlight 
around. And when I first got to the submarine, they gave me this like rinky dink flashlight with a like triple A <laughs> battery and, and you could barely read with the thing. And I said, no, no, no. So I went down to Home Depot. I bought a mag light with like 27 uh, AA batteries that weighed <laughs> about eight pounds. And it, and it was a club, but I could shine it and it was into dark corners and it became sort of the symbol of like, let's see how bad it is so we can make it better. And like, let's stop kidding ourselves. Yeah. And I realized one day my flashlight, that was my lightsaber. Now you write, mm. you can write the whole story without ever mentioning the flashlight. Why would you like, what role does it play? Then I realized it's my lightsaber. Yeah. And so I talk about the flashlight in the book. Now the reader doesn't ever realize it. The reader just, it's just somehow like gets you in here. And I think this is one of the, the I was lucky that it, it, it caught on, but some of these things are deliberate attachments to, to these core fundamental, deeply seated human uh, desires. Uh, we're going to wrap up this first segment. And we always ask the following three questions. The first one being, how do you find purpose in what you do? So when I left the submarine, Eventually, I found my way to the Pentagon, mm. and I worked in an incredibly toxic environment, yelling, screaming, throwing coffee cups, things like that. And it wasn't good for me. And I, I developed some medical issues, and I had to separate. I was 90. When I left the Na Navy, I was 90 percent disabled. I was 10 percent. I was 10 percent from dead. Wow. And. Uh, I, it was it was horrible, and I don't the pro. I truly to this day believe these were not evil people. Yeah. They were they were people who were just programmed. This is the way they'd seen their bosses respond, and this is the way their bosses had seen their. And so we're programmed to for these unhelpful ways of treating human beings, and it's got to be better. It yeah. doesn't have to be that way, and I don't. And I and for me, it's personal. Mm. Doctors have to take an oath because we see the connection between the doctor's behavior and the health of the patient. Leaders, there's no oath, but leaders arguably have the ability to affect the health of the health of many more people. Yeah, it's it's long. It's a slow burn. We don't realize twenty years later a person has heart disease because of the toxic environment that we put them in or the kid their kids are bullies because we bring home stress that we vent on our family and bad leadership is much more toxic in terms of health costs than bad medicine yeah yeah so so so, so, so we're going to make a better world we're going to make a world where people go to work and they don't feel the crap that I had to feel, like I had to put my humanity in a box, I had to play a game, I had to play a role, I had to say yes or yes or three bags full, the idiotic <laughs> ideas because no one could like tolerate any kind of dissent and, and, and all that stress, which takes a toll on your humanity and, and since it takes a toll on humanity, it takes a toll on your health. Yeah. We got to do better than that. And by the way, it's better for everybody. It's better for the leader too because we'll make more resilient it, the world, there's too many complex problems to say, oh, well, like 10 experts in the cloud or they're going to figure it out. No, everyone. We need everyone. Yeah, I love that. And that's one of the things I love about the book. What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome and what you're doing? I think that one of the problems that one of, we have, we all wired, we have human biases. And one of the ones that I know that I have is ego preservation. Mm. We... And I have mechanisms for dealing with it. I call I, I, I try to invoke the get better self. So, mm -hmm. hey, how could it, you know, how could I be better? How could I do things better? How was how did I show up at the meeting? How can I be a better how can I be a better husband or how can I be a better dad? Uh, but I I do know that there are, there are ways. <clears throat> in my life that would that my life would probably more be more effective and richer if I were to even more completely put my ego aside and uh, seek uh, feedback. So in small, I'm playing the uh, feedback game, mm. which is yeah. every day 
I try and ask someone to give me feedback on something that I've done. And a lot of days it's, it's in, Hey, how was my driving? How was I as, how was I uh, as a, as a customer here at, at uh, Tim Hortons? Um, but it gets you in the habit and you realize nothing bad happens. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, like, oh, you suck. Oh, well, oh well, how was that? Well, you paid with cash. Who does that? You held up the line. <laughs> no, I'm not that guy. But, you know, like that kind of thing. But it just sort of you, you get, it becomes more fun and you can have a richer life. So I think that's one. I struggle with that. Our final question in this segment is what's the next big dream, next big idea or goal that you have? So the trilogy here is, hey, it's painted a story, how it could be, turn the ship around. Mm -hmm. You can have a workplace where everyone's thinking, next, how do, we, how do we create the environment that's leadership as language? What words do we use to let the doers be the deciders? So here's the third thing now. Okay, now that we've done all that, but they're making bad decisions. What, what, why do we make bad decisions? What are the themes? What are the patterns? The way we think about it is we're revealing patterns that exist. So, for example, I think one of the patterns, uh, I, we're just sort of early days on this, but I'm pretty sure one of the patterns is going to be short-term thinking. In other words, we're wired to just live today. Like, I don't need to worry about a retirement plan 30 years from now. You're, our ancestors 100, 10,000, 100,000 years ago didn't care about that because it, they weren't going to live that long. They just had to survive <laughs> outrunning the tiger right now. Yeah. Like, don't talk about retirement plans. I just got to run away from the tiger and but but the problem is a life of just running away from one tiger after the next and then we have no retirement plan so long-term thinking almost always will give us a different calculus on how to look at a decision than if we just say oh i want to win today i had a fun fun ex experience i was with a company uh i was speaking after the ceo the ceo says about uh, he talks about their value. Their value was blah 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 in the long run, <laughs> blah 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 in the long run. Blah, blah. He said it like eight times, and I made a poll, electronic poll, and I asked people. I got on stage. They didn't know who I was and what I was going to talk about yet. Yeah, say before we start, I got to ask a question. When the when the CEO says in the long run, what does he mean? And I had one week, one month, uh, one year, one decade, and then just for fun, at the very last minute, I added one day and one century. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We had responses in every category. Ambiguity. So, every category. So if in the long run, for me, means a century, but for you means a day, then yeah, we're going to get different responses. So, uh, so, so, so my next thing is to try and understand these uh, human tendencies that we don't want to trust our gut. Mm where we want to override our gut. And I think the short-term thinking is one of them. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, we are going to go deep into Leadership is a Language, talk about the book, how it can change your structures around your thinking of a new playbook for the future. We'll be right back. Hey there, it's Mike. As an entrepreneur and a small business owner for the last 13 years, I can tell you that one of my biggest pain points has been hiring the right team. Do you hire an employee, a freelancer, or use one of those online services? The options are truly endless. And when I speak to other entrepreneurs and business owners, they often share that they face the same problems. Probably a problem you faced yourself. It's even harder when you're trying to hire a creative professional for your next great design, website, email campaign, copywriting, and video editing. Today, I want to tell you about some friends of ours, Floxy. Floxy offers unlimited projects by a vetted creative team for a flat monthly rate. Video editing, graphic design, writing, web design, and more. They can help you. And they're constantly adding categories where they can help you in the future, too. Their project managers are U.S.-based, giving you same-day responses and 24-hour turnaround for most requests, all with a simple fixed monthly price. And agencies are welcome, too. Here's what one of their users, Zach, says about working with Floxy. They're very responsive. 
Floxy has been incredible for us. They have consistently delivered amazing work. Sometimes I'm surprised by how much they can actually tackle in 24 hours. When there has been rework required, my project manager is awesome at getting it done super quick. I've tried other unlimited graphics services before, but Floxy, hands down, is the best. Best of all, because you're a listener of JumboThink, they're going to give you 10% off your first month with a 14-day money-back guarantee. All you have to do is visit Floxy, F-L-O-C-K-S-Y dot com slash JumboThink. That's Floxy dot com slash JumboThink. So get the design that you need, get the website you've always wanted, and have the perfectly edited video of your dreams simply by visiting Floxy.com slash JumboThink. Now let's jump back into our conversation with today's guest, Captain David Marquet. We are back with Captain David Marquet. Before we dive into this conversation about the book, people need to know how they can find the book. So where do they need to go? Type in, go to Google or Amazon or Barnes and Nobles and type in leadership is language and it will pop up. <laughs> Our website's at tempbaseleadership.com and I'm on social media, L. David Marquet, because my parents cursed me by calling me by my middle name. So it made my life hard, but <laughs> that's what parents are for. And of course I pass it on to my kids. So L David Marquet, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And to make it easier for you listening, they're all in the episode notes. You just have to click a magic button. It will take you right there. You don't even have to remember a thing. So check that out. You definitely need to check the book out. I have it right in front of me. Uh, I'm loving See it. Ya. Yeah. It's right <laughs> here, right here. Yeah. And I, there's so much we could talk about in this book, and I was jotting down some notes before we started. The first place I wanted to start was simply the playbook that we're playing from. You, you mentioned the industrial age, and you mentioned how we are treating people more like cogs than individuals. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about why we need to shift from this and what we're missing by trying to play a new game from an old playbook. We got to let the doers be the deciders. This is the big difference. In the industrial age, organizations were designed with two, the two kinds of work, doing and deciding or act, doing and thinking, were assigned to two different groups of people, management, white collar, college educated, salary worker were assigned the decision making part of work and hourly workers, blue collar typically high school educated people were assigned the doing part of work. So the problem isn't doing and deciding. The problem is assigning them to different classes of people. Now we need to get the people doing the work, also making decisions about the work, which means the people who used to be the deciders have to give up some of this control. They, and the job shifts from, from making decisions to creating a structure by which the correct decisions are, are made. So, my my problem was, as I went through my own life and we interacted with companies, we started assembling this long list of don't say this, say that. Mm. So, for example, we would hear people, I'm at a construction site, there's a pre-shop, pre-shift brief. First of all, that's that's not a good word. Brief is passive for everyone. I show up, I get told what to do, I go. Back. <laughs> so we change that. And then and, and people says, blah, 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 we good to go? In other words, it's a binary self-affirming question. Yeah. It, the, the, the purpose, the structure of that question is to get conformity and compliance. It's not to invite people to actually speak up and say, no, we're not good to go. If you were interested, interested in that, you would say, what are we missing? How could this go wrong? What was unclear? You want to ask a question in a way that makes it easy for someone to say, no, we got a problem. There's ice up there on the third deck. So, but the, but here's the problem. You can't remember a list of 50 of those. Yeah. So what you have to do is have a structure. So the question is, what's the structure? Now you can invent a new structure or you can simply understand the structure that already exists. 
And, and the way I think about it is we're simply revealing a structure that already exists. And as I go, went through life, I said, why am I saying it this other way? And I realized it's because that's the way the factories were run. Mm. And the factories were run with six main plays. It's like we're programmed. I was I, so I got so all this is kind of in my head. And I'm not really sure how to go about it. I get on an airplane. I'm flying from San Francisco to Tampa mm-hmm. on a red eye. A guy sits down next to me. He's got this big duffel bag. He takes out this big three ring binder. He throws it on the on the tray. He starts flipping through it. And I look over and it's a playbook. Now I've been thinking about playbook as one of the ways to organize the thing. And I go, oh, it looks like a play- that head looks like a playbook. And he says, yeah, it has a 49er logo on the front. And I said, <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, are you with the 49ers? He goes, yeah, I'm John Gruden. I'm the head coach. <laughs> I go, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Gruden had been in Tampa. So anyways, at Tampa, that it was, it was, he was on the San Francisco Tampa play. So I said, well, tell me about these play playbooks. And he starts showing them to me. The first plays have nothing to do with football. Mm. They're about how to talk in the locker room, how to talk off the field, how to talk. And I said, I said, this is interesting. I, I, I was sort of expecting the little lines and the like, yeah. you go this way kind of thing. He says, no, no, it's all about language. Mm. And as soon as he said that, I said, this is a sign from the heavens. <laughs> it's a playbook. And then, and then the more I thought about it, it just fit perfectly. We have plays, we run them. For example, we obey the clock. Here's the industrial age plays. Now let's see if they ring true to the listeners. Obey the clock, then we coerce the people to comply with what we want them to do with a sense of continuing the job as long as possible. Don't interrupt the production line. And we have to prove that we're doing a good job. And overall, we conform to our hierarchical roles. All right, now scrap all that. What you want (laughs) is to control the clock so we can say time out. Hey, let's everyone shift to thinking mode where we collaborate. And then because it's coming from within, we commit to the next chunk of work, which we we view in in terms of chunks that we complete. Completion allows us to do two things, celebrate and then reflect, which allows us to then improve the work, not just prove. And finally, in order to make this whole thing work, we have to connect as human beings. Connection allows us to be healthy emotionally. Healthy emotions allow for healthy decision making. In the industrial age, I didn't care about it. I didn't need to connect as a human being. In fact, Human connections inhibited my ability to coerce you. <laughs> so our programming at work is to conform to role. Mm. That's why executives have special dining rooms where they can hide from the masses. We teach this from the time we're in kindergarten, the whole way through high school. We teach people that this is the way to do it. I, I think of a friend of mine. He's in the Merchant Marines. And... Uh, they're laying cable up in the Baltic and they're telling the people that are the 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 thinkers, uh, the captain saying back, hey, we can't lay right now. There's too much ice. We can't get out there. Well, you got to go do it. This is where and they're like, this isn't going to work. So they go out yeah. and they, they get sent back and their people, the thinkers again, are back in a room going, well, it should have worked. I don't understand. Well, there's ice there that we can't break. And so now they're coming back and saying, uh, well, try this. And they're like, it's not going to work. And so you have doers who are thinking, who are pushing back all that to say something that's so ingrained in our society and our thinking and our process. How do we make the pivot to reprogram this? How do we start actually making the, the red work, the blue work, as you call it? Yeah. How do we bring that together and start, start, I guess first step moving from the the red worker and blue worker to bringing it back to the kind of work and then bringing it back to a place where people are in the process of doing and thinking and doing and thinking and processing. Yeah. So there's a couple of uh, bumper stickers and phrases that we use, which are let the doers be the deciders and push the authority to where the information is, not the information to where the authority is. Mm. But the answer to your question is, how do we do it? Is we do it, we act our way to new thinking. We do it in small incremental steps. One of the exercises we take leadership teams through is when they say, okay, we want to change our culture. We want a new leadership model. We know we don't want command and control. 
we're not sure what it looks like. Okay, well, let's work on that. Let's like picture it when it's when it's going right. We yeah, start with the question: What would it sound like if? What would it sound? I say, well, what? How do you want your team to be? And that people generally write eh, nebulous words like we want them to be collaborative, empowering, whatever, risk embracing. And then we say, okay, what would it sound like if? And then now that triggers a specific scenario and specific words. So we ask them, hey, you're designing a two-year program to change the culture from A to B. Mm. But, but we, don't, we don't give them that. That's what they're really doing, but that's not what we ask them to do. We say, I want you to design a two-year program so that your company can operate in Spanish or English with a flip of a coin. Design, okay. that, pro- design that program. Okay. And, and they come up with all these things. Well, we 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 get the, sort of well, we have some native Spanish speakers, so they take some uh, they take a certain role in uh, helping people. We we every wor- every morning we have a Spanish word of the day. Uh, we start greeting our, each other in Spanish. We start <laughs> uh, we, you know we'll t- we go to the, the 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 kitchen and we'll tape the Spanish word for you know refrigerator and coffee on on different things. No one ever says, "Oh, we're going to go to one one day offsite and call us good in Spanish." Right. So, so, so then we say, "Okay, great," and we don't. We give them like fifteen minutes, and then we say, "Okay, great." Now replace the word Spanish with leadership, mm. because your leaders, le- everything that happens in leadership is a language, and just like you need two languages, Spanish and English, you need two languages of leadership. One language is the language of focus. Mm. It's we got to get it done. We're going to start. We, we are in the procedure for starting the reactor. It's going to go A, B, C, D, E, not A, B, D, C, E. <laughs> That's bad. That's yeah. killing. You kill people that way. But then we're going to but we're going to wrap around that a language where we embrace variability, where we say, oh, well, how can we make starting the reactor better? And even before that, are we going to start? It? How safe is it? What team are we going to use? That's thinking. So we embrace variability and make it easy to invoke. The problem people are doing is they're bringing a reduced variability playbook to an embrace variability game. Mm. The industrial age was about reduced variability. The thinking age is going to be about embrace variability. But here's the irony. You actually need both. Okay. You need Like even today, we still say, okay, let's make a decision. We want the software to go in a certain direction. We want to build a product that achieves ABC, but you still have to code it. Yeah. But you don't go code for two years and they say, oh, look, we we bring forth a rose. (laughs) Well, that's great. I was hoping for a trout. Yeah. (laughs) Two years down the drain. And I know how that is because I work in the world of code and – yeah. If you're not doing confirmation to check back, we're on the same page in the same place. It doesn't work out well. One of the things that I noticed when I was reading the book, you talk about, uh, you know, people who were in, let's say, Pennsylvania. I, I live in Pennsylvania. And so yeah. Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, let's say I'm not from there, but uh, they they grew up in the steel industry. They cut their teeth on the steel industry. Uh, they worked in the factories, they did the job, they did the deed uh, that they're supposed to do. And then you talk about how that creates a generational pattern and conditions next generations for what their role is in the system. And and I, I, I would say it would probably happen on the other side with people who go to college, become executives. And so there's a pattern of that too. Uh, how do we start more conversations? Leadership is obviously a decision from the top and how we're going to approach this. But how do we have these conversations to move from, I'm a red worker, you're a blue worker, uh, I do my thing, you do your thing. How do we move to the place of we in the place of having that conversation and bringing uh, more clarity? Uh, you know, there's there's the function of changing the leadership style, but there's also – a, a, an individual level of reconditioning your own thinking because of the experience of growing up as a child of a steel worker, let's say, or a co- coal worker and moving to that next season of, of what a, a new society looks like. Yeah. My mom grew up in Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Her father worked for us steel for about 45 years. And First off is we have cultural labels. Mm. 
if you're going to let the doers be the deciders, there's no differentiate. There's no white collar, blue collar anymore. We're all in it together and we're all red work is the focus doing work. Blue work is the thinking, deciding work. Instead of saying red work is performed by one group of people and blue work by a different, we're all doing red work and blue work. We're just oscillating back and forth. Yeah. So the labels, these old labels, which attach to those kinds of work are no longer helpful. Here's what's happening. In the industrial age, if I relegate you and say, okay, you're a red worker, you're going to do doing work. Oh, now there are these things called machines, <laughs> robots, AI. algorithms, yeah. <laughs> AI. They're taking red work job. Sucks to be you. Yeah. Okay. That's not good. So the difference is, that what you want to do is like the work is now it's all going to be blue work. It's going to be decisions because all the red work is going to be outsourced to the robots. Humans are actually not that good at red work. Yeah. We're not really suited to sitting on an assembly line for eight hours. Yeah. So what we want to do is create structures where we all pause. We all get there together. I don't sit at the head of the table like, some lord and let the minions kneel around the rest of the you know scraps and, and 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 sort of coerce them into my way of thinking it has to be true collaboration of of equals based on the ideas that we have that's where we want to go but here's the secret it's not only better and more respect, respectful for the people, the hitherto red workers, it's better for the organization and us as well, yeah. because we're learning and we'll be adaptive. We'll actually be in business in a hundred years. Yes. Because in a hundred years, even if I'm right, 99 times out of a hundred, the one time I'm wrong, you know what? No one's going to speak up <laughs> and we're out of business. Boom. It's over. You only you need to go. You only got out of business once. Yeah. So, Every year you got to endure, you got to build a resilient organization where people can say, well, here's, I see a little bit different. And when you erect barriers to that, don't go blaming them for not speaking up. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, it's going to be rapid fire questions. We have a lot of exciting stuff in store for 2020, and we want to keep you in the loop. So how do you stay in touch with JumbleThink? Head on over to JumbleThink.com where you can sign up for our newsletter or you can click on one of those magical buttons to, to far off lands like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. That way you can stay in the know where you can stay in the pulse of upcoming episodes. You can make sure to catch us at events and even some exciting things we're working on for later this year. So head on over to JumbleThink.com. Let's connect and let's chase our dreams and ideas together. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with today's guest, Captain David Marquet. Mettez le contact, reposez votre bras et attendez. Restez calme pendant. We are back with Captain Marquet. All right, rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Can't scare me. All right. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Submarine commander. What is one tip you give someone with a big idea and dream and they don't know where to start? Start small. What is one change you would like to see in the world? We got to let the doers be the deciders. We got we to gotta, we gotta be human and let people think. Love that. Where do you find inspiration? I, every day when I go out and I'm flying to some throw the dart at the chart. And yeah, okay, if I go to Manhattan or Silicon Valley, you expect to find great ideas and people – I go going to I, I don't want to say a place because it's not like I'm denigrating it, but but any place. And and you're like, oh my gosh, there's amazing things happening here. Like everywhere. Mm. Like there's no geographic limit on where the smart people are and the rest of us are. It's everywhere. And everywhere I go, I find people who want are trying to make the world a better place. Uh, I, when I was in China, 
I, this is not rapid fire, I guess, but <laughs> I had an amazing experience where I was with, with this Chinese executive MBA, where there were like 400 people. Yeah. And then me, like the lone white dude. <laughs> and I'm like, so I've been told that Chinese people just like to be told what to do. And this whole idea of empowerment was not going to work. What do you guys think? And the whole place erupted. I, I gave them two minutes. They talk about for two minutes. The whole place erupted. And it, it, I called my wife at the end of that. I said, I could be in Kansas. They, is it, they want exactly what we want. And they're wow. like, no, no, that's you guys. Like, yes. Do I want a job with purpose? Do I want a job with meaning? Do I want to have influence? Do I want to have control? Do I want, want ideas that are valued? I want, do I want to be able to feel safe to express them? Yes, 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 yes. It's no different. Like, wow. We think it's different. That's because we're full of BS. Yeah, that's so good because I think it's so often we think that we have the edge on innovation and ideas here in the States. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's just not true. No. It's, every, I've been so many places in the last seven years doing – I've given 700 keynotes all over the world. And what I realize is we are more the same mm. – generational color of skin gender we are more the same than we are different so good what do you want your legacy to be i want a better world of work mm. for my kids for your kids for everyone around us i want a world where people can feel safe to raise their hand and have a different idea and to say you know i'm not sure that this 737 max software is good to go. <laughs> Saves for, a lot of problems down the road for sure. For example, yeah. And that's one of the things in the book that I liked uh, that stuck stood out to me. She shared the story of the truck driver who isn't making the decisions on his route or truck maintenance or anything like that. And then when something goes catastrophic with his truck, Usually it's someone that made a decision a long time ago that probably doesn't even remember making that decision that's now yeah. actually being the, the catalyst for this problem. And the driver's the one getting the blame when the actual decision's not even something he can make. Yeah, the driver's on the side of the road because he's got a problem with his truck. Well, meantime, the maintenance plan, the routing, <laughs> the loading, the hours that he's going to work, all that is controlled by other people. And then we, quote, have to hold – them well how do we hold people accountable what <laughs> hold yourself accountable uh, it's so frustrating i loved that picture in the book because i never even thought about that because as a, a agency owner i think of my team and it's like well whose fault is it and often <laughs> it's not as clear cut as we try to make it and, and and that just lit up for me when i read that in the book yeah. And well, that comes from a true story. I was, I worked with a trucking company and they were, I was some of the, so give me some examples of like how it, we don't want it to be. And that was one of the stories, by the way, just go look in the mirror. You'll know whose fault it is. It's your company. <laughs> <laughs> how do you define success? Success is creating an environment for the people to be great around you, no matter how they are. Love that. What is one trend you're currently excited about? The possibility. Mm that more and more of humanity will be freed from the drudgery of assembly line work, production work, and that we're going to get all that over to the machines and that humans can go back to being human again, where we can think, be creative, use our minds and, uh, and feel excited and satisfied about what's going on. What is one habit that is helpful in your own life? It just drives my wife a little bit crazy, but I have what I call routines. Mm. And I don't I'm, – I'm old enough at this point where – so, for example, my workouts, I have goals. Like I really would like to run a marathon, a half marathon in an hour and a half. It's never going to happen again. But all I focus on is the routine – Every morning I do a 20-minute yoga, then I do some stretching. Uh, I do Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I do core activity. And uh, then I do the Sudoku, and then I do the New York Times crossword puzzle. And these routines, it's the behavior, the repeated behavior will result in me being 
I suck at the New York Times crossword, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I only started this about a year ago, and uh, but I can see I'm getting better, and I and I can see I'm more flexible, and it's tough, people. When you're young, like start doing this, do do yoga every day. That'll help you out more than anything else I said in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but but the idea is. If you focus on the input side, the, the part you can control, because you can't control, like I, controlling whether I run an, a 90 minute half marathon, you can feel like maybe I can't control that. But a lot of things in business you can't control. Yeah. If, if coronavirus tanks the world economy, you're, oh, we're going we're gonna to increase revenue by 6% next year. Yeah, good luck with that. It, <laughs> You're not, you yeah. can't control it, but you can control the inputs to that. So focus on what you can control and stop stressing on the stuff you can't control. That's just gonna make your life worse. So focus on your, and he, so here's the thing, you can only control yourself. Love. So yeah. I guess that's what my little routines are for me. And they give me a sense of the morning started, once I get through the end of that routine, and I said, now in the morning, nothing bad can happen today because I'm on the right track. Wow. Our final rapid fire question is, what is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I want to run the uh, Mount Blanc marathon. That's cool. It's super cool. So it's a marathon, but it's up and over Mount Blanc. So it's like up at 10,000 feet and it's up and down. And it's, it's crazy. So I started doing these trail runs. It's been a, I, I love it because... I, I go to all these different cities, so I do it in these different places. And, and and again, I'm not very good, okay? But I don't, I just don't quit. Yeah. I just don't quit. Like, I'm the tortoise in the story. <laughs> and I'm just not going to quit. And uh, so in the next couple of years, um, yeah, check with me. I'm doing it. What is your final thought you want to leave all of us with today as we wrap up today's show? What what we all do as humans is we can be so amazing if we think about our our about helping create environments for others to be the best they can be. Mm. We all have greatness inside of us. Mm. Even even the person who cut me off in traffic and the person who didn't feel the pot coffee pot <laughs> yeah. we, we gotta believe in that yeah and, and we think we're special like oh no all, only i have greatness inside of me but but so do you and you and you and i if i can believe in your greatness mm. it'll make it easier for you to believe in your greatness and it'll make it easier for for that to come out that inner superhero and then what a great world would that be super cool Thanks so much for taking time out, sharing your story, giving us some insights. Everyone listening, you really need to check out this book, especially if you're in leadership of any level. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging me, and I, I think it's going to challenge all of you who are listening too. David, thanks again for being on. Thanks, Michael. Once again, we want to thank Captain David Marquet for taking time out and being on the show with us today. You can check out all of his links in the episode notes wherever you are listening. We also want to thank our friends over at Floxy for sponsoring today's show. Whether you need a graphic designer, a video editor, or even your next great website built, they are there to help you. And what's really cool about their program is that they are a monthly subscription to unlimited design and development services so check them out by heading on over to floxy.com slash jumblethink that's f-l-o-c-k-s-y dot com slash jumblethink and because you're a listener of jumblethink they're going to give you 10 percent off your first month now it's your turn to get out there we believe that you are created for something awesome that your dreams and ideas matter that you are significant now, the way that you might impact this world may seem small, but I guarantee that small impacts make big differences consistently done over your lifetime. So get out there and take those risks. Step into the unknown. Step into the fears that you have about chasing those dreams and ideas. Thanks again for tuning in to Jumble Think. Now get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. Vous êtes une autre personne.
mère de famille, les enfants peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.